Hello. A smart and beautiful little six-year-old girl recently asked me, hey, Spicy Chandilla, what do you do? So I looked at her and I said, well, holding your mama's hand firmly and feeling truly proud, I will whisper lovingly, we are both very grateful for who you are and what you do on a daily basis. My little princess turned round to me and smiled. I then said, well, what do you really think I do? So she grabbed my telephone and pretending to be me, she said, do you have the money? Can we do a bigger deal? If not, the banks will say no. Just like that, a little six-year-old worked out what a leverage buyout was. I still haven't worked it out, but anyway. Uh, so having learned that, I thought, well, why don't I encourage her to use her creativity and her sense of imagination to push the boundaries further? And then I said, I'm going to tell you something, and in a couple of days, you're going to tell me what you think it actually is. So I said, your task, Princess Noah, is to fix the bad debts of small countries. And the answer is to use oil to swap it for debt. So, so during one of our movie nights, she turned around to me and said, Papa Chandilla, am I right in thinking that if I swapped my spare toys with my friend's spare Legos, his dad sold my toys and then gave my mum money from those toys to buy new Legos as and when we need them. Is that what you asked me to think about? I said, yes, my sweetheart. Now, if you were to listen to my old economics teacher, Mr. Burns, he would flatly disagree with that. And years and years ago, he told me, Fernando, the superior knowledge of applied economics is frankly secondary to mastering the basics of theory. Burns and I never really had a great relationship, but I'm sure after this it'll be even worse. So thinking of Burns, let's treat debt like a single bright flame on a cold winter's day. Stand close and don't get burnt. On the other hand, think of equity. I think of equity like a Venus flytrap. Stay in it, and it all works out well, great. If it doesn't, here's the reality. We won't see you again. So by now, you must be wondering, what is this man saying? So let me pull it back a little bit further. Historically, governments around the world of all political persuasions seek to do the one thing that they have to do is to get elected. And getting elected is about making promises, right? New roads, big lights, great schools, fantastic hospitals. Oh, yes, and the other one, particularly in this part of the world, vote for me, I'll give you a job. And shh, don't tell him, build an airport while you're at it as well. <laughs> so you, you have this, this ongoing circus of promises. But what does that circus really mean to each one of you? I'll tell you what it means. When those promises go out the window, or some enormous public sector infrastructure project fails, you and I, as taxpayers, have to pick up that tab. And do you know how politicians do it? It's very simple. Think about VAT in this country and the recent hike. The government has shifted its burden of debt to you. You pay increased VAT to support those foreign loans. Now, the biggest challenge with this is that this happens on a recurring basis. It doesn't change. So if you were to think about a possibility of swapping debts with oil, people say, well, why would anyone want to do that? Why would an oil-rich country turn around and say, well, do you know what? I'll give the government of Sri Lanka some oil and put its loans together and then get them to pay it on an affordable basis, on a monthly basis, and it's all good. Why would they do it? What's the rationale? In the world in which we live in today, things are changing very, very significantly, particularly at a geopolitical level. 
If you think about what Saudi Arabia said this year, the Deputy Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia specifically said that his country by 2030 will move away from an oil dependency. I mean, on one level, that's outrageous. Move away from oil? You're Saudi Arabia? How's that possible? But herein lies, the, lies a very significant question. If you take any of the G8 nations, let's assume Britain, France, USA, Germany, they're all dependent on one particular country for government-to-government -government contracts, Saudi Arabia. Now, if you think about Saudi Arabia as a country, let's look at some of its characteristics. Flippantly, you might say, they like gold watches, gold engraved buildings, they have huge planes, they spend lots of money, Oh, and they have oil gushing out of the floor, so you know, they can spend any amount of money at any given time, because guess what? There's more where that came from. But pull it back. Why did the Deputy Crown Prince say that? And herein lies a potential solution for a country like Sri Lanka and other countries which are heavily indebted because of past failings in public infrastructure projects or making promises that you can't keep. If you can imagine that it's possible to turn that relationship on its head and think of these magic words, Donald Trump. <laughs> think of what Trump has done to the Republican Party. You know, there was that kid at school who was really scrawny, really difficult, extremely annoying. But he landed from some other school, and on his first day, he went around the playground and beat the living daylights out of everybody, cleaned it all up, and told the headmaster, there's a new man in charge. It's me. So picture the headlines. Sri Lanka now is a GCC country, and Saudi Arabia is part of it. Scary or absolutely ridiculous. But here's the thing in, in economics. More often than not, for every innovation, there's a constellation that says to each of us, well, here's how this could work, and yet this is how it escapes us. But at the same time, why would an oil, like I asked you earlier, why would an oil-rich country even dream of doing this? What's the point? Why help out an indebted nation? So that leads me to the piece where it's very important for each of us to understand that more often than not, it's about that question, why? Why, why, why? Remember I told you about a little princess. Her name's Noah. After everything that I tell her, she asks me the question, why? And at one point, I run out of answers for why. Because why becomes another why. But there's a reason, because if you think about it, each of us needs to understand our other person's prejudices or comprehension of what we say for them to get close to us. And at one point, if they do, then we have a mutual understanding from which we can go forward. Now, effecting an oil for debt swap sounds extremely complicated. But here's something which I'd like to share with you, which I passionately believe the government of Sri Lanka could do with your help. You all know what a bookmaker is. So how about this? Tomorrow, go and buy a betting slip, which has the following bet. Spend a rupee, or 5,000 rupees, or 10,000 rupees, it doesn't matter. An oil for debt swap taking place between Sri Lanka and Saudi Arabia between 2016 and 2017. I guarantee you the odds will be at least 5,000 to 1. Now, the money men in the room are going to start to work this one out, that even if it doesn't happen or you short the stock, it'll still raise the price. So if you were to do that, and if the president were to find chunk loads of betting slips in his office, and if you think back to 1996 when Sri Lanka won the World Cup cricket, and everyone said, this is ridiculous, with Pramod the Vikram Singh, you're not going to win that tournament, and you did, then there's a possibility. And that possibility is as follows. If you do the betting slips, and then after that, if you toot the horn outside the Saudi diplomatic mission on a daily basis to give the guy earache, he should complain to the president and say, excuse me, why are you doing this? This is extremely annoying. All your people are tooting a horn outside my office. The third bit, if you remember I told you about the deputy crown prince wanting to move away from 
an oil-dependent economy, then he would have the opportunity, if he creates this swap, by absorbing debt, turning it into an affordable loan over a longer period of time, and supplying the excess oil supplies to a country like Sri Lanka, he has the opportunity to prolong his income from his oil. Fourth, if you wind it back a little bit further, imagine as a country, you're able to tell the world, hey, look, we came up with an alternative solution to just refinancing our debt or taking on more debt that is unsustainable. Fifth, if you're a president, at the end of the day, your game is about your legacy. So imagine if you can turn Sri Lanka, where currently today, 96 cents out of every dollar is going in foreign debt repayment, into Asia, Southeast Asia's number one destination for foreign investment and trade, and then by default, you become the world's ultimate affordable luxury tourist destination. It's not bad, is it? By doing that and having an alternative mechanism for clearing the bad debts of a small country, by default, the country will be eligible for a Nobel Prize in economics. Strange, right? But what I'm really talking about is that sense of compassion that is required at the moment of absolute economic need to restore that and restore that human dignity for people. Because at the end of the day, things should be used and people should be loved. And today, that balance has shifted. This journey that I have been on and continue to be on, started when I was 18, when I had this idea that the global economy ran like a dysfunctional credit card. In those days, I used to use my dad's, but anyway, he won't let me near it now. So now at 38, I remain resolutely committed to visionary presidents and prime ministers who want to build the legacy of our times that is a world free of bad debt. But to do that, ladies and gentlemen, they cannot do it on their own. It is nothing other than people power. What separates Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan people from economic freedom is that betting slip. Bettina and Noah, the two people who have driven me to do this, one, they holds the key to my soul in terms of her eyes, and the other one is the hand around my heart. They drive me each day to be better but I do this in the firm belief that the bigger picture, the big economy, the big questions can all be answered by you. In the past, blueprints for change and people driving those blueprints for change, even in this country, have been fast asleep at the wheel. So when you go back today, if you remember nothing else from what I've told you, just take that flutter, because after all, if you spent 10,000 rupees, you'd earn 50 million rupees and never have to work again, provided the bet came off. There are many things that we can try and do in life. Achievements both on the sporting field, in working life, in our personal life. But it all comes down to one very basic thing. As a wise old man told me living in Florida, Young man, what will you do with your dash? I said, what do you mean, what will I do with my dash? All of you know on a tombstone there is 1929 dash 1965 or 79 or 85. And when you leave this earth, you can write about two lines on that. So part of this blueprint for change is not only the recognition that to do something it needs the collective group of people, but also to understand individually, at the end of the day, all we can ever be as a man, depending on who you choose, who you are, is a devoted husband and a loving father, because that's about all you can write on that tombstone. The courage to do something different, the courage to change things, the courage to be someone that others cannot accept or choose not to accept, that's difficult. Explaining to you that fixing the global economy or clearing Sri Lanka's debts is no more than a game of Lego 
and exchanging Legos sounds difficult, sounds implausible, but the truth of it is this. If you buy the, be buy the betting slips, I'll fix the rest. I'll hold your president to account and any other world leader that wants to. Or that can be made to. Because understand something, your vote, your decisions, your taxes, who you are as people and what you do for this country is sovereign. No one can take that away from you. And in the end, if you don't exercise that right, if you don't call your politicians to account, if you don't look at the global map and think that your country and you deserve more and better, then no matter what we say on this stage or any other stage, falls on deaf ears. Our job is to inspire you. Our role in life is to inspire you, to dream, to dream big. I am probably criticized for being the biggest dreamer ever, to the point where my mother will pick up the phone and say, oh, here he goes again. But why? Because deep inside me, I hold a passion and a love for this subject called global debt because I believe that it is time, as His Holiness the Pope said, to stop huge collateral damage of human life through debt. The time has come, even for Islam as a religion, to preach a different story. It is misunderstood. It is, appears to be this voice of war on the global stage, when it is not. And the root cause of all of this is nothing much more than that story I told you about Donald Trump, the bully in the playground, the big countries, the small countries, and how the small countries have to take control of their destiny with you, the people. The betting slip separates us collectively from economic freedom or unmanageable government debt. I told you about the two people who mean the world to me, and on that note, thank you and thanking them for making me who I am today and where I have come to. It has been an enormous joy, privilege, and honor to talk to you today, and I hope that tomorrow you will at least toot your horn when you pass the Saudi mission just to annoy him a little bit. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, what's an idea for if you don't use it? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.